Hey folks, it's Ray at DCRamRocket.com here, and today I've got nine new things to know about the Fitbit Charge 4. Now, I've been using this for a while now, so I've got a pretty good idea on what works well and what may need a still a little bit of love. Uh, so as such, this video is not sponsored in any way, shape, or form. Just me talking about all the newness here, what works well, and again, what might not be so hot. Now, the first thing to know before we get into the official nine things is the pricing. Uh, this is 149, 149 US dollars. Put the other currencies on right now there. There's also the Fitbit 4 Special Edition, which is 169. That simply gets you these extra bands, or technically one extra band in three parts. Uh, that is a fancier looking band. There is no other difference between the two. It's just simply the bands and the bands only. That's a notable departure from the past where the special edition of a Fitbit variant usually had some other features. Again, same software, same hardware, just simply extra bands. So with that, let's get into the first new item on the Charge 4, which is the fact that it has GPS in it. In the past, the way it worked is if you wanted GPS tracks after the fact, for example, upload to Strava, you had to go ahead and have your phone nearby. Versus now, there's GPS built inside of this. Fitbit claims about five hours of GPS on battery life. And in my testing, that seems about right. I would say it's between four and five hours, but pretty much close enough. That's different, however, than normal battery life, which is seven days when the GPS isn't on. And for that, it also seems about right, but it's a bit tough for me to tell because I charged a bunch of times because I had a bunch of really long GPS activities. So the way it works when you want to start a GPS activity is you go ahead and you just swipe to the right, you choose exercise there, you choose the sport you want, if you want to go and turn off GPS, you would swipe up at this point, and then you would choose to turn off the GPS. But if I went out for a run, for example, outside, GPS is on by default. You wait for GPS to find signal. Generally, it takes between five and 10 seconds. Then you press it again, and you're off and running, quite literally. Uh, as you're running, it'll go ahead and show your pace using GPS. Uh, it also shows your distance, again, using GPS. Uh, and all that seems to work more or less just fine. Uh, pace stability, in other words, how stable is that pace if you're running pretty stable, seems to be mostly pretty good. A couple wobbles here and there, but it's in the ballpark of what most folks would want. From an accuracy standpoint, that also looks pretty good. I did a bunch of different accuracy testing around this in woods and non-woods and tall buildings and all that kind of stuff. And for the most part, it's pretty solid. It does seem to occasionally cut corners a little bit more than I would like, but on the whole, it's not too bad. If you want to see a bunch of different GPS accuracy testing, check out my full written review. It's linked down below or somewhere on the screen there. I go into excruciatingly painful detail on both the GPS and the heart rate accuracy of the Charge 4. Moving on to number two on the list is the addition of Fitbit Pay. So that means that you can take a credit card, debit card, and load it onto this watch, assuming your bank supports that. And we'll get to that part in just a moment there. From there, you've got to go ahead and hold down the button, go to a nearby merchant, and tap to pay for something. Pretty straightforward. You've probably been using it on your phone for quite a while. And Fitbit's had it on their wearables for quite a while too, but only at the Versa and Ionic, basically their higher-end wearables. So it's the first time we've seen it at a $149 price point from Fitbit, or actually really from anyone. Uh, so there's no other company that I know of that has a $150 wearable band uh, that has GPS in it and that has contactless payments in it. And part of that is because doing contactless payments in a wearable is really, really tough because you have to talk to every single bank out there, which gets back to that first bit of whether or not your bank supports it. Fitbit has a site you can look through and see if your bank is on the list there. It's not as simply saying all Visa or all Amex or all MasterCards, your actual issuing bank has to support that. So to put that into context, for me in the US, my issuing bank for most of my credit cards is Chase, and Chase is supported. So I was able to load on my Chase card onto the swatch, no problem. All you do is walk through the Fitbit app, it takes a couple seconds, you get to add it, and then from there, adds it to the device. And then from there, you hold down the button on the side for a second, you type in your PIN code. Once that's complete, the PIN code part is a bit messy, but you get used to it, I guess. Then you go ahead and just tap it on payment reader, and you're done, straightforward. But that was for the US. I live in the Netherlands, and here my bank ING isn't supported. It's not on the list at all, though most other major Dutch banks are. Also, I have cards from France, and those ones aren't supported either. So you're gonna have to go to the site and see whether or not your bank is added there. At this point, being a few years down the road, if your bank isn't on there, it's probably not looking super positive. Of course, Fitbit is adding banks all the time, but just kind of keep that in mind. This isn't something brand new. Speaking of support, by the way, if you're finding this video interesting or useful, just simply whack that like button down the bottom. It only takes a second and it really helps out this video and the channel quite a bit. So next on the list is the new sleep metrics, in particular, sleep score. That's a score from zero to 100, though hopefully not at like the zero side of things, that judges your sleep for the night. The higher your sleep, the higher quality your sleep, the higher the score. Uh, and in most cases, for me, having toddlers at home, that ranged about in the 70 or so range for a sleep score. I'd say that seemed maybe a wee bit optimistic, but 
I guess I'll have to take it. To see your sleep score, you can actually see it in the summary view on the Fitbit Charge 4 itself, or you can see it later on in the smartphone app, the Fitbit app there. Uh, you can also see in the Fitbit app your sleep stages and durations. You can plot them over time and all the graphical good goodness that you'd expect from pretty much any other app, including the Fitbit app. Also, Fitbit does offer the Fitbit Premium service, which is something you can pay for, uh, and that gives you a bunch of sleep plans and things like that. So sleep guidance or coaching to hopefully give you better sleep. In my case, if I were to do that, my toddlers would just laugh at me. Also, Fitbit has promised a new feature, which is a smart wake feature uh, that will allow you to go ahead and set an alarm, for example, 7.30 a.m., and then it'll wake you at some point between 7 and 7.30, depending on your particular sleep stages or phases. Uh, now, in this case, Fitbit hasn't promised a date. They're just saying coming soon which unfortunately Fitbit's history in this particular coming soon category is not super strong. Uh, the last time they promised something coming soon, it was almost a year later. So we'll have to see on that one. It is something that is on many other wearables, so hopefully we'll see Fitbit implement it sometime soon. Number four on the list is the addition of Spotify. Kind of, sort of. I mean, it's more like a Spotify remote than it is a Spotify on the watch, the wearable, the thing. So the most important thing to take away from this is there is no music on the Fitbit Charge 4, period. You cannot put music on the Far Charge 4, the Farge 4, the Any 4, it cannot go on this wearable itself. You cannot play music directly from this to your headphones. Again, just to make that super duper clear, no music on here. What it does though, is it controls music somewhere else. So you go and you take the Charge 4, in particular the Fitbit app, and you link it up to your Spotify account, behind the scenes of some magic. And then from there, you can take this and control your Spotify playing on your phone or on your computer or on anything else Spotify plays on, you can control it there uh, via your wrist. Technically speaking, it mostly works sometimes, though not always. Sometimes it gives me like an app error or something else. But when it does work, it allows you to go ahead and play different playlists. You can actually swipe through them here. You can stop and start songs. You can go ahead and all the things that you'd expect from a remote control, but from your wrist. In practice though, it's just not super useful. Like it's just kind of cumbersome to get into, to use, to swipe. It's just, just pull out your phone. You have to be near your phone anyways. So I'm sure there are some very slim scenarios where maybe you have this on you in a gym and your phone's in a bag close enough that range sort of works and your headphones, you control it that way. But honestly, I appreciate the gesture, but I'll pass, thanks. Maybe just put music on there, that'd be cool. But again, there's not music on here. On the bright side, that does bring us number five on the list, which is addition of active zone minutes. Active zone minutes are basically Fitbit giving you credit for doing more intense workouts. But to step back a little bit, talk about sort of the zone minute goal, which is that you have 150 active zone minutes per week. That falls alongside the American Health Association, the WHO guidelines of 150 minutes of exercise per week, or roughly five times 30 minutes uh, per week. How you divide that up though is really up to you. It's something that many of the wearable companies have been doing for a long, long time. And so Fitbit's gone into that and they've rebranded parts of it and given you more credit for more intense workouts. So to put this into context, let's say you do a 40 minute run. And the first 10 minutes are a relative basic warm up pace. You'll get 10 minutes of active zone minutes credit for that. Uh, think of like 10 coins instead. But then you go and do 20 minutes of hard running. For that, you'll be in a different zone, a harder zone, and you may get 40 minutes of credit for that 20 minutes of running. So at the end of your run, you could end up with say 60 active zone minutes for only a 40 minute run. Kind of a cool concept and kind of makes sense if you're doing really hard workouts. You'll be able to see your active zone minutes on the device itself at the end of a workout, as well as in the Fitbit app. Uh, and you can see how many active zone minutes you have towards your weekly goal as well on the device and also in the Fitbit app. Which gets us right into the next one, which is the new heart rate zones, or in particular, the new active zones. The idea behind this is to take generic heart rate zones and give them fancy names like fat burning zone and cardio zone and things like that. Um, they're basically just heart rate zones that you can probably actually remember in your head. You can lightly customize some of these zones in the Fitbit app, uh, but for the most part, they are what they are and the way they are structured are what they are. Uh, but as you're doing a workout, you'll get notifications each time you change zones. You can turn that off though if it's annoying, just in the settings for each individual workout type. Uh, and then after the fact in the app, you'll see which zones you were and how much time you spent in each zone. And then on the map itself, you'll see which zones you were in as you were running or riding, whatever the case. It's pretty cool actually when you look at the map and see that for an interval workout, because you can see the hard part, the work effort of that being in red, and you can see the easier parts being in orange because I was doing recovery there. Uh, so it's kind of neat there. 
Overall, again, nothing earth shattering, but it's somewhat appreciated to sort of take the sports side of it and push it a bit more into the more basic wearables that Fitbit has. Next up on the list, there is a new weather option, our weather widget. That means that you can swipe through here, go to the weather option right there, and then see the current weather around you. Um, so if you're in a dark cave like I am right now, I can see what it's doing outside. You can also go ahead and add your friend's house on there by adding another city uh, or multiple cities if you want to. And then you can swipe through and see those cities as well pretty straightforward. Also straightforward is the next feature, which is the addition of the agenda. So in that same widget roll there, you swipe until you find agenda, and now you'll be able to connect it up to your calendar on your phone. You can also choose to show or not show free time, uh, so that way you can see what's free in your calendar uh, versus just assuming that your entire day is free and it didn't sync properly or whatever the case may be. And the last but not least on the list here is they've added a boatload more watch faces or clock faces. Uh, in the past, that was somewhat limited. Now you have 24, which means it's somewhat less limited. Uh, you can't customize much of anything on them, but they are there. You can choose which ones you want, swipe through the different options on the app, apply it to the watch, the band, and you're good to go. Okay, so there you go, kind of a complete look at the overall picture of all the new features. The question is though, how does this fit into the greater landscape of activity trackers or wearables or sport focused wearables? And I'd say it fits in pretty darn well. At 149 bucks, there is nothing else out there on the market that has contactless payments and GPS in it and this form factor and has a seven day battery life and, and, and. That's solid. So if you're out there looking for something to go and do a casual like 5K or 10K runs, this is a really great option for you. However, if you're looking into something that has more features in it, this might not be it. For example, you can't customize any of the data fields on the sport modes. You can choose different sport modes, but you can't say which fields are on there or which fields you do or don't want or which pages you do or don't want. That stuff is all kind of the way it is. It's their style and you can't tweak any of it. So you gotta sort of figure out what you want. Same goes for GPS battery time. If you're looking to do a longer day hike, this won't really cut it. At four to five hours of GPS on time, if you left in the morning, even came back at five o'clock, you would have had your battery die around two or three o'clock in the afternoon. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Still, for the vast majority of people, this is an awesome option for the price. And it's nice to see Fitbit kind of sort of finally getting it. I feel like the last couple of years have been a little bit like a, every time I look at them, you're like, mm, maybe, I guess, on sale uh, versus this. I don't think this has to be on sale very often to still be a pretty solid deal. So there you go. Hope you found this interesting or whatever the case may be. If so, again, whack that like button down the bottom there or hit the subscribe button because there is plenty more sports technology and particular wearable goodness coming up over the next couple of weeks that you will not want to miss out on. With that, have a good one.